Exhibit. Well, it's not an exhibit, but the document upon which the uh, agent is relying. Yeah, I, I have, Your Honor, and my concern is this. It seems to me, and I'd like to be corrected on this, is that the intention of the state is not just to say Ms. Harris was active on Facebook or that she was uh, uh, posting or whatnot uh, during this time period, uh, uh, which I think would probably be fine to um, try to rebut the claim that, that we may well make that she wasn't functioning the way that she needed to be during this time. They want to go a step further and identify groups that she was, uh, you know, a participant in, or however they describe it. I don't know the level of participation. Identify the group by name. Some of them are fairly salacious and are simply more prejudicial than probative. There is no benefit, there's no value or evidentiary value to it except to inflame the passions of the jury to identify these groups. If they want to say she was active, if there was a particular posts that were made to rebut that, I don't have an issue with that. Um, but just the mere participation, whatever level that may be, or clicked on like on a group, uh, just so they can get in the name of that group, I don't think it's relevant and it's more prejudicial and appropriate. You've mentioned one, Ms. Timmons, mentioned some of the other that would be allegedly salacious. No, there were two. Uh, the first group is the sexy little psycho bitch group, and the other group is my la la ladies with Brandy Waller. And I believe Brandy Waller is a girl too. Anything further? Any rebuttal by the state? Just what I said before, Your Honor, that they want to present the defendant as being submissive and in an abusive relationship and depressed and all of these things, yet her activities on Facebook would be about that. I will allow the agent to testify that he's reviewed her, her Facebook activity. Uh, he can testify that she was active on Facebook, whatever that term is. I don't think we need to mention the site she went into at this time because I don't think this, the defendant has introduced anything yet. So we don't know where we're going. Uh, if the defendant doesn't introduce anything involving her mental status or make an argument that her mental health contributed to this incident, then I've just introduced sites that she's visited on Facebook that might be salacious, as you said, for no particular purpose, other than to say that she was involved in a site called Sexy Little Bitches, whatever it was. So let's not go there. We may. I'm not saying it's not relevant or may not be relevant at a later time. I just don't find it relevant at this time. However, you can ask him if she was active on Facebook during that time period. All right. Bring the jury in. Be seated. All right, continue, Ms. Timmons. Agent Turbot, I want to talk some about the Facebook material that, that you obtained. You said earlier at some point you did obtain the defendant's Facebook records. Yes. This is probably unnecessary, but can you just briefly describe what Facebook is? A social networking site where people are able to communicate with associates or friends, share photos, those types of things, keep up with, with life. What was the date range of the records that you received? August 1st to September 30th of 2017. Of 2017. How many rec pages of records was provided to you for that date range? Facebook provided 84 pages of records. And were those pages or those records registered to a specific email? Yes. And what email was that? I believe that was um, Cheyenne, was, um, pardon me, I'm not sure I remember, it had, it had the defendant's first and last name in it, I believe at gmail.com was the registered email. Would Cheyenne Cohen 97 at gmail.com sound right? Yes. Was there a, a username or vanity name associated with the records? Yes, I believe that was uh, Cheyenne uh, 
Is it Dot Harris Dot Five O Seven? Did the records list the date of birth for uh, the user? Yes. And what was that? February seventeenth, nineteen ninety-seven. Is that the defendant's date of birth? Yes. All right, when was the Facebook account set up or registered? In April of 2017, early April. Did the records account uh, or list a current city? At, at that time it said Riceville, Iowa. And through your investigation, that would be consistent that Cheyenne Harris lived in Riceville in April of 2017? Yes. Did the records list a phone number uh, connected with the account? It did. And what phone number was that? I don't recall the specific number. I remember I compared that, and that was the cell phone number that we had uh, been provided by the defendant and by the defendant's uh, significant other as well for her. All right, you looked through these Facebook records. Yes. Between August 1st and August 30th, 2017, did you see that there was activity on the account? Yes. Uh, the account, uh, did you see things such as uh, friend requests and, and different types of social activity? Yes, there were friend requests. And did you notice anything about some of those friend requests? I recall that the defendant sent some of those requests and then you can also receive, other people can attempt to friend you, so she had, there was both some sending of requests, receiving of requests, um, I recall there was also some accepting and some rejecting, so there was some decision making in the, the friending process. And this was during the month of August 2017? Yes. Um, how many friends did she have on her Facebook account? 48. Uh, did she belong to uh, any groups on Facebook? Yes, several. All right, now the on Facebook, you, you yourself can reply to people and post and do things like that. Did you see that type of activity? Yes, there was some uh, posting and replying during that time frame. Did she post any photos? Yes, she did. There was a photo of a dog, her dog, and it looked like she'd also shared some photos of some fashion, um, some different items of clothing. In all of the Facebook activity that you did see, uh, was there any reference that the defendant made in regards to her being troubled or feeling sad? No. Was there any anything that you saw where she was reaching out for help from someone or, or saying that she was depressed? <laughs> Not at all. All right, you did receive the medical examiner's report at some point, correct? Yes. Once that was obtained, was the decision made to arrest the defendant? Yes. You got arrest warrants? Yes. When was that? The report was finalized October 16 of 2017. Those are mailed, they're not emailed, so we received it shortly after that. Arrest warrants were sought uh, fairly immediately and arrests were made uh, October 25th, I believe. Of 2017? Of 2017. And, and who was arrested that day? Uh, both the defendant and Zach Cohn. What were they charged with? Child endangerment, causing death, and murder in the first degree. I have no further questions. Cross-examination. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Were you the one that arrested Ms. Harris? I was not. Were you there when that happened? I was not. Uh, when you uh, saw her back in 2017, do you know if she weighed the same as she does today? I believe she was uh, thinner at the time that I saw her. Uh, so much so you could see that in the face, correct? Yes. When you did the search warrant of the house, uh, or excuse me, the apartment, did you did you find a, a notebook there that had like uh, directions for caring for children? Someone found that, and I remember seeing it at some point. Okay, would that have been collected and put into evidence? 
I don't know if that was photographed or if it was collected. I'd have to look at the receipts for what was actually seized. Okay, who would know that? You just have to check the case file and see what was what was seized for sure. That was on the list of items seized. Okay. When you were getting the uh, buckle swabs, uh, I think you described Zach as being belligerent. Yes. Would that be like combative? He was upset. Okay. Did did Miss Harris uh, assist in getting him calmed down so that he, he would comply? She did at some point tell him he needed to calm down and, and just provide the swab. Thank you, sir. Okay. Redirect. So the defendant told Zach Cohen to calm down, and Zach Cohen did and gave the swab. Yes, she told him to, and that's the, the time when he calmed down and allowed me to take the swab. That's all. Tom Baker? Nothing further, thank you. Can the agent be released? Yes. You are free to go, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Next witness. The state calls Chris Calloway. I do. Have a seat. Right, before we begin this testimony, we have a stipulation that Ms. Timmons would like to address. Go ahead. Uh, the part, parties stipulate to the following evidence. Following the death of Sterling Cohen, DNA samples were collected from Sterling Cohen, Zachary Cohen, and Cheyenne Harris. DNA testing and comparisons were performed by criminalist Sabrina Seehofer at the Iowa Division of Criminalistics Laboratory in Anchorage, Iowa. Based on the testing and comparison results, the parties stipulate and agree that Sterling Cohen, beyond a reasonable doubt, is the biological child of Zachary Cohen and Cheyenne Harris. Is that so stipulated, Mr. Uh, Hawbaker? It is, The jury will consider that stipulation as if it was presented in court as evidence here today. Proceed. Thank you. Uh, sir, if you could please state your first and last name and spell them for the record. Chris Calloway, C-H-R-I-S-C-A-L-L-A-W-A-Y. And Mr. Calloway, how are you employed, sir? I'm a special agent with the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation. And are you assigned to the same zone as Mr. Keel and Mr. Turbot? Yes. Can you please describe for the jury first your educational background? I'm a graduate of the University of Iowa with a degree in sociology. And and how about your uh, experience uh, being trained to be a peace officer? Okay. Um, in the same year after I graduated from Iowa, I went to the Iowa Department of Public Safety's Academy <clears throat> down at Kim Dodge. And uh, then after that, I was a uh, Capitol Police officer for two years in Des Moines followed by 12 years as an Iowa State Trooper. And then since uh, July of 2004, I've been a DCI agent. And do you have a special assignment with the DCI currently? I'm in the Major Crimes Unit. And how long have you uh, been assigned to the Major Crimes Unit? Uh, since July of 2004. And so, sir, total experience that you have, if you could explain the number of years you've had with the DCI. Uh, since the DCI? Um, 15. And good. how about with the Department of Public Safety in total? Uh, 28 will be 29 this summer. In what field office are you assigned to, sir? Mason City. Now, do you have experience in your law enforcement career in dealing with death investigations? Yes, that's part of our, our job. How about specifically death investigations involving children? Yes. And, and how often would you guess or say in an average year do you investigate child deaths? Um, we have a zone of, of seven agents, um, so I, it, it can range. I mean, some years are, are more than others, but probably around five, uh, five up to ten a year. Now, how did you first become aware that there was an ongoing investigation on August the 30th, 2017, 
uh, into the circumstances surrounding the death of Sterling Cohn. All of our agents were gathered for a, uh, a meeting and some training in Cedar Falls, uh, what we call a zone meeting. And I saw John get pulled away, and then shortly thereafter they asked me to also go to Chickasaw County to assist. And when you say John, you mean John Turbot, correct? Yes. And so what was your uh, assignment, or how was it that you became assigned to assist in the investigation? Uh, we have a special agent in charge that um, will initially assign the case to a case agent, and then the case agent usually determines what role individual agents that are assisting will play. And did you learn who would be the case agent into the investigation into the death of Sterling Cohn? Yes. And who was that? Uh, Special Agent John Turbin. And what was, uh, once you were assigned to assist Special Agent Turbin, what did you do? Um, we both left Cedar Falls around the same time and, and drove to the Chickasaw County Sheriff's Office. It looks like from your report you arrived at the Chickasaw County Sheriff's Office at approximately 2.30, correct? That sounds about right. When you arrived at the Chickasaw County Sheriff's Office, what did you do, do to kind of get up to speed as to where the investigation stood at that point? Yeah, we spoke with uh, Chief Deputy Reed Palo, and he kind of filled us in on what was known at that point, the original call, um, his response, and, and what others had seen when they had entered the house. And so what in general information did you have at your fingertips when you uh, were done being briefed by the local law enforcement agency? Um, we knew it was in a, like an apartment in Alta Vista. It involved a, a four-month-old uh, baby boy um, that appeared sickly is, is one of the descriptions that somebody had said. Did you know what the cause of death of Sterling Cohn was? No. Um, did you yourself go to the apartment where Sterling was located? Not until much later. And so what task were you assigned uh, to complete <clears throat> upon your arrival here in Chickasaw County subsequent to being briefed? Uh, my job was to interview uh, Cheyenne Harris. And it appears that from your report that you uh, uh, met her or encountered her at about 2.45 that same day, August the 30th, correct? Yes. How did that occur? Um, we were at the Sheriff's Office. We were uh, upstairs uh, speaking with Chief Deputy Palo. And um, I believe the defendant and uh, Zach Cohen had arrived in a car. Um, eventually, Reed um, introduced me to Cheyenne because he had had initial contact with her out at the scene. And uh, then I began uh, interacting with her once she finished her, her uh, phone call. She was on the phone. Did you ask to speak to her? Yes. Um, did she have to speak to you? No, she did not. She wasn't required to do that? No. Did she voluntarily speak, to, voluntarily speak to you? Yes. Why was it that you wanted to speak to her? Well, in a situation like this where so little is known about uh, what had happened, uh, we, there was a lot of things to learn. Basically, her history, Zach's history, um, the, the baby's history, um, any, any fight, family dynamics going on, anything else. I mean, we just... Um, really, that's our, our first and best way to get information uh, is from the, from the people that are involved. And where did your interview of Ms. Harris take place? Um, out in front of the Chickasaw County Sheriff's Office, uh, we ended up speaking in my, in my car, the car that I'm issued by the state of Iowa. Was there any particular reason that you uh, picked that location to conduct the interview? Um, in my discussions with John briefly, um, he was going to ask uh, Zach to interview upstairs in the Chickasaw County. They have only one interview room. And uh, so for privacy and, and comfort, um, I just asked Cheyenne. She was already outside if she'd be willing to sit in my car. Was it a conscious decision to interview Cheyenne Harris separately than Mr. Cohn? Yes. Why was that? Um, a lot of different reasons. Mainly, uh, I wanted to get her side of the story. Oftentimes, if you try to do an interview with two people, uh, one person will do all the talking and the other one just sits there. And so I want to hear what she has to say, um, her side of the story, and she can tell me things. And also, um, should there be any dynamics going on between the two, she would feel comfortable or um, she would be separated from Zach to talk to me. Was the interview that you conducted with Ms. Harris audio recorded? Yes. 
Have you had a chance to listen to that audio recording, which is State's Exhibit Number 97, prior to taking the witness stand here today? I did. Is it an accurate recording of the conversation that you had with Ms. Harris? Yes. And it appears from the recording it's about two hours and 47 or 48 minutes long. Is that right? Yes. Your Honor, I'd move for the admission of State's Exhibit Number 97. No objection, Your Honor. It's admitted. And we're going to play that recording in a couple minutes, Mr. Kelly, but I have a few other preliminary questions to ask you first, okay? Now, I want to kind of have you explain to the jury what you knew prior to conducting the interview uh, of Ms. Harris as to the condition of Sterling Cohn's body, okay? Um, you've already testified that you didn't know what caused his death, correct? Yes. Um, had the autopsy of Mr. Uh, of Sterling Cohen, the baby, been performed yet? No. Uh, did you know uh, the condition of his body? No. Did you know the condition of his clothing? No. Did you know the condition of his diaper? No. Did you know, you've already said you didn't know what caused his death. How did that impact how you approached your interview with Ms. Harris? Well, <clears throat> I'm speaking with a mother that has just lost her child. Um, I don't know the cause of that, and, and so I have to be cognizant of her feelings and, and um, the repercussions uh, of how I approach that. And so um, I just want to ask her questions. I want her to, to tell me truthful, honest answers. And did you treat her in many ways like a grieving parent? Yes. Did you know if the cause of death was something natural or disease related? I did not know. When you interacted with Ms. Harris for that two hours and 45 or 50 minutes, can you kind of describe your observations of her and her demeanor and mood and how she interacted <clears throat> with you? Yeah, initially she was on a phone call, uh, I believe with her mom, and she ended that and then came and sat in my car. Um, getting off the phone, she was a little teary-eyed, she was sniffling a little bit. She sat in the front seat. I have a, a Ford Taurus, which is a, just a, a plain old four-door sedan. Um, she sat and talked with me, and it was, it was very conversational. Um, I asked questions, she'd answer, she would elaborate on on certain things, some things I would ask follow-up questions to, and that went on like that for about two hours and 50 minutes. Did she ever appear to be confused? No. And you described it as kind of a normal conversation, is that right? Yes. What, what do you mean by that? Well, a lot of the, the interview is just getting to know her, uh, finding out her history, finding out where she's lived, her history with, with Zach, um, history of the children, and so those are questions that I'm asking and, and she's providing answers to. Now you've had, you, you said, uh, the experience of conducting a lot of investigations involving child deaths, correct? Yes. Do you have experience then uh, related to those child deaths interacting with parents who have just lost their children? Yes. How would you uh, uh, compare or contrast the demeanor of Miss Harris uh, with those other interviews of other parents who have lost children? Yeah, initially um, appropriate. I mean, she was sad and, and uh, um, you could see that. But as the conversation went on, it was, it was um, more nonchalant. The conversation was, was pretty easygoing um, and it was long. Um, so... I mean, that's how it's, it, it would be different. Okay. When you say nonchalant, what, what do you mean by that? Um, she provided a lot of detail in her answers uh, that might not necessarily be relevant. I mean, it, it was appreciated. Um, oftentimes, when I'm dealing with uh, somebody that has lost somebody, they don't want to sit in my car for two hours and 50 minutes. They want to you know, make notifications, they want to do things that, that need to get done. Fair enough. During your interactions with Ms. Harris on August 30th, 2017, did she appear to be oriented to time and place? Yes. Based on your observations and in your interview with her, do you have an opinion as to whether or not she comprehended your questions? Oh yeah, she did. And did she provide you answers that were 
content appropriate to the questions that you were asking? Very. Was there any time that she wasn't coherent and logical? No. Um, do you have any experience dealing with people who are intoxicated by drugs or alcohol? Yes. Can you describe that experience? Well, I've, in, in 28 years of law enforcement, the first 14, you know, working traffic stops and working the, the street, um, dealt with a lot of people that were intoxicated, intoxicated drivers, uh, people under the influence of methamphetamine, uh, marijuana, other drugs. Did you have any concerns at all during the nearly three hours that you interacted with Ms. Harris that she was impaired in any way by any alcohol or drugs or medications? No. Did she ever tell you that she was under the influence of any illegal drugs, methamphetamines, or medications, or alcohol? She did not. Did she appear to be well rested? Yes. And did you ask her and ascertain from her how much sleep she had had the night before? I did. And what did she tell you? She said she had uh, seven hours. Did she appear to be sleepy or sleep deprived or excessively tired when you interviewed her? No. Now, at the beginning of the interview, you, you started by gathering information uh, on the background of the defendant. Is that right? Yes. Was she able to provide you with a chronological details of her life and movements her and her family had made, her relationship with uh, her live-in boyfriend, uh, Zachary Cohn? Yes, she was. Was she able to give you the birth <coughs> dates of her children? Yes. Did you ask her during your interview if the defendant was taking any medications? I did. Why would you do that? Um, one, interest. Uh, two, it might be helpful should we determine that the child might have died from uh, ingestion of, or accidental ingestion or an intentional ingestion of, of a controlled substance. And when you asked her about her history of taking medications, what did Ms. Harris tell you? Uh, that she wasn't currently taking any medication. She had taken some after the birth of Nala, uh, roughly 20 months before, um, and that lasted about a week, and, and, uh, and then she came off of that. During your nearly three-hour uh, interview with Ms. Harris, did she ever volunteer to you that she was depressed or suffering from postpartum depression? No. And how would you describe her mood when you were interacting with her? You mentioned before that it was teary eyed, then became normal. Was there anything different than that? No, I mean it was. There were. It was conversational, I guess. It was. Um, <clears throat> there were times that she was. She would that she lit up um, when she was talking about certain topics, and in other times that she was. Um, she would just answer the questions matter of factly. Well, can you think of a time when she lit up? Um, specifically when she would talk about her, her dog and uh, Nala. Did you ask her about her history of using illegal drugs? I did. Why do you do that? Again, it, it's, it would be helpful for us. At this early stage, we really know nothing. I never met her. Um, I didn't know any of the, the family history, and so... Um, I don't know what's going to be important, what's going to later turn out to be important. So that's just some of the questions that I try to ask in, in almost every interview in a situation like this. And what did she tell you about her the use of illegal drugs or history of use of illegal drugs? She said that she had uh, tried methamphetamine um, in the past, and she kind of um, dated it around the time of... of it was before they moved into this apartment in Alta Vista. And so we later put that together to mean um, the end, before the end of May, first part of June. And then I also asked her about marijuana, and she said that she had used marijuana regularly, but that was in the past, several years in the past. During the interview, did you ask Ms. Harris about her family financial situation? I did. Did she identify any particular... Uh, financial stress or anything like that? I wouldn't call it stress. I mean, she she described her, you know, the, the income that was coming in and and her expenses. And that's uh, detailed in the interview itself? Yes. Um, did you ask her whether or not um, the, the children were covered by health insurance? Yes. What did she tell you? 
but they were. So did you tell you what type of insurance covered the children? Um, it's a uh, WIC. And that included Nala and Sterling Bowl? Yes. Did you ask her about Sterling's health in the time leading up to Sterling's death? Yes, I did. Was she able to identify any concerns that she had about Sterling's health or his condition, physical condition, in she, the time before his death? She did not. I want to ask about the conversations you had with her concerning her description of, and as the defendant's, interactions with Sterling in the 24 hours before his death. Did you ask her to describe her interactions with Sterling in the last day of his life? Yes, I did. And what did she tell you? She said that, uh, and she tried to give me a time frame, um, that she had checked on Sterling uh, before Zach went to work. She also described it as um, around darkness or right before it got dark. <clears throat> and then, uh, then she went back and checked on Sterling noon the next day. So give us the time frame of how long Sterling was not checked hour-wise based on what she told you. Yeah, I, I was kind of running the math in, in my head and it, it amounted to about 19 hours. When she checked on Sterling, uh, when she told you she checked on Sterling, did she say whether or not she fed or changed Sterling? Um, I don't believe so. But the interview, I assume, would be the best uh, record of that, correct? Yes. And that's the reason you recorded it, right? Yes. Now, you asked her what, what the doctors would find when they checked Sterling, correct? Yes, I did. Why did you ask that question? I was generally interested in her answer. And what did she say? Um, she said that Zach had mentioned something about a sudden in, in, infant death. Was she able to provide any other possibility for what may have caused Sterling's death? <clears throat> no. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I would ask permission to publish State's Exhibit Number 97, the reporting. Any objection? Under Your Honor. Granted. Your Honor, along with that, um, the, the State has prepared uh, a transcript of that reporting, which is uh, Court's Exhibit Number 150. And, and Special Agent Callaway, have you compared that transcript to the recording, the audio recording? I did. And does the transcript uh, accurately uh, reflect the content of the audio recording? Yes. And isn't it true that the audio recording is a, a little hard to hear at, point, at points? Yes. And would that, would that transcript help the jury to, uh, to comprehend the uh, uh, audio recording, say exhibit number 97? Certainly. Did it help you? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Your Honor, I'd ask for permission for the jury to also uh, while they listen to the recording, have access to copies of State's Exhibit 150. Any objection? Okay. Granted. And I move for the admission of Court Exhibit 150 at this time. It's admitted. Do you wish uh, to have the agent remain on this, Mr. McAllister? Do you want the agent to remain on the stand? Uh, if possible, Your Honor, if you could step down, please. You sure can.